Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. Last week on the channel we looked at one of the early 90s most iconic arcade games. This run and gun known as Sunset Riders is regularly celebrated for being one of the finest games in its genre and one of the greatest Wild West themed games ever made. This is a title that is consistently brought up in best of all time lists for what it brought to the table. So holding this thought, it is quite surprising that there was no official sequel released. This may be the case, but if we look hard enough, a sort of pseudo sequel developed by Konami does in fact very much exist. Today ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be looking at Wild West Cowboys of Moon Mesa, a 4 player Wild West themed run and gun, released just one short year after the original Sunset Riders game which in my opinion is every bit as good as the game everyone seems to talk about. So we are going to be comparing and contrasting these two quality experiences, analysing the quality Wild West Cowboys delivers and discussing why this game is so overlooked and often forgotten in present times. This ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of Wild West Cowboys of Moon Mesa, the forgotten Sunset Riders 2. Yeah. At quick glance, you can see Sunset Riders and Wild West Cowboys of Moon Mesa look very similar in terms of both gameplay and setting, but there are actually further Konami arcade games we need to link into today's tale for it all to make sense, and those games include the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles entries. We have already looked at the fantastic Turtles beat-em-ups that were created by Konami and even noted the small easter egg to the games found within one of the boss fights during Sunset Riders. Konami were very proud of these games and the commercial success that they would lead to. The quality experiences the games presented, paired with the popularity of the Turtles brand itself, meant that these games could print money. Due to the money the intellectual property was making, it was obviously not long at all before a range of copycat franchises would start popping up in order to cash in on the Turtles craze. Some of the most famous examples of these clones include the likes of the Biker Mice from Mars, Street Sharks and Battletoads. It is always important to remember that corporations are full of very greedy people who lack shame or any kind of integrity, so it would make very little sense for people of that ilk to bother coming up with new interesting concepts when they can just make more money simply by ripping off others. One of the many Turtles clone shows was an often forgotten series known of course as Wild West Cowboys of Mumesa. However, at least with this one, it was intrinsically linked with the Turtles and the plot at least deviated away from the usual premise enough for this one to stand out just a little bit more than the others. On a surface level, the series told the generic tale of a bunch of animals being mutated into anthropomorphic creatures, or in this franchise's case, bovipomorphic. This was caused by an irradiated comet striking Earth in the late 19th century. The story revolves, like a gun, you get that one, around a group of peacekeepers known as the Cowboys, with C-O-L, Cow, being an acronym for Code of the West. Which is strange in itself, as shouldn't that be Cottle rather than Cow? Anyway, the Cowboys try to maintain peace in Cowtown from countless rule breakers with episodes in the series often being inspired by old tales of the Wild West. The group of main protagonists is led by Marshall Moo Montana, who is known to be courageous and quick on his hooves, forever dreaming of creating a safe place to graze. We then have the Dakota Dude, the cool tempered muscle of the group, and Cal Larado Kid, the youngster of the group and self proclaimed ladies man or ladies cow born. In the supporting cast we have Lily Bovine, a former showgirl who is basically the April O'Neill of the show, and the main villains are the corrupt regulators of Cowtown, named Mayor Oscar Bulloni and Sheriff Terra Bull who are essentially the Shredder and Krang of the show. If I could meet the creators of the show, I would let them know that their clone is very impressive. They must be very proud. Prior to explaining the plot of the show, I briefly mentioned that this franchise is more intrinsically linked with the Turtles than many of the other clones. This is because this American animated television series was created by comic book artist Ryan Brown, known for his work on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
Away from the comics, he would also design a number of the Turtles action figures, including Hothead, Scratch and Monty Moose for example. Whilst the Turtles had a slow burning rise to popularity, starting out with the Humble comic book series back in 1984, Ryan Brown designed the Cowboys of Mumesa to be a literal cash cow. So apart from a TV animated series being released in 1992, a Wild West Cowboys of Moon Mesa comic book series was also launched that same year, which was written by Brown's longtime collaborator Doug Brammer. There was also a toy line created and sold by Hasbro, and of course a video game which was released by Konami. It seems like there was no intention to let the Cowboys grow organically in popularity at all and instead Ryan Brown would fire on all cylinders in an effort to shove this product in as many children's faces as possible, with even a second season of the TV show running in 1993. However, despite the efforts made, the franchise never picked up much steam and would fade into complete obscurity soon after. In fact, this whole story feels very deja vu thus far in that it is all very reminiscent of the push to get the Cadillacs and Dinosaurs franchise off the ground, with Capcom developing a video game before the animated series even aired. At least in Cadillacs and Dinosaurs case though, it had found some success previously with the Xenozoic Tales comic books. Wild West Cowboys of Moon Mesa never even had that luxury to its name. So bearing in mind that this Konami game was based off of an obscure property that did not even have its animated show broadcast particularly outside of North America, it is no wonder that not many people are familiar with this game or franchise. Thinking about it, the license that is attached to this game also goes a long way in explaining why the game has not popped up elsewhere since its initial arcade release either and why it probably would not have been profitable to port this game over to the Super Nintendo or Sega Mega Drive like Sunset Riders. Now going back to Sunset Riders, the fact that Konami had previously already programmed a Wild West themed run and gun, paired with the success they had found with Turtles in the past, both probably contributed to Konami taking the Wild West Cowboys license on. Since Sunset Riders already existed, Konami basically already had a game engine perfectly suitable to use when developing such a game. The Wild West Cowboys of Moon Mesa's license fit Konami like a glove. So now we have covered what exactly this franchise was about, it is time we analyse its Sunset Riders-esque video game. The game's introduction depicts the comet hitting the earth, resulting in the mutation of the cows into cowboys which is pretty handy really, considering the distribution of this arcade game was over a wider range of regions than what the animated show aired in. Being a 4 player run and gun, like Sunset Riders, players can take control of 4 different heroes. As mentioned earlier, unlike Sunset Riders or even Turtles itself, the Cowboys TV show only focused around 3 heroes, so to make up the numbers in this game, the town's resident blacksmith known as Buffalo Bull is shoehorned in as our fourth main protagonist, or should I say, bullhorned in. <laughs> Upon starting a playthrough, you will instantly notice how similar the opening stage in this game looks to the one found in Sunset Riders, however in Cowboy's case, this game seems to have an even more bold cartoony aesthetic, if that makes sense. In some ways, this game has been mechanically built on further than with the release of Sunset Riders in that when a player taps both the jump and attack button simultaneously, they can perform a charging ball technique, which makes perfect sense considering the characters we are playing as. Performing this manoeuvre is taught early on, when the game instructs the player on how to knock down a pile of barrels acting as an obstacle. Throughout the game, there are chickens to shoot in the air who drop power-ups and dynamite kegs to ignite to perform satisfying screen nukes but everything else is mostly very, very Sunset Riders, including the ability to jump up the higher parts of the buildings on each level. As expected, with most Konami games from this period, each of the game's stages finish off with a boss fight. In the first stage's case, players must take on Sheriff Terrible, one of the main villains from the TV show. This large oath has a lot of health, but many of his attacks can be avoided simply by jumping or ducking. Interestingly, after this, a lot of choice is presented to the player in that you can manually choose which order that you want to conquer each stage in. 
Next, we will discuss the game's canyon stage, which contains wooden doors to shoot down, a feature once again brought over from Sunset Riders. There is also a section where players must swim up a waterfall avoiding objects from above, a mechanic I would see reused later in Earthworm Jim, which I would play regularly in my own childhood. At the top, there are plenty of bandits to take out, followed up with a mid-boss fight against a giant snake in a cave who can only be damaged by making contact with its head. Players are then break into a fortress, taking out more bandits and new enemies wielding machine guns, shooting from watchtowers above, before finally taking on a threatening looking spider boss at the end of the stage. This can be a tough fight due to this character's varied attacks and fast movement patterns. Like in Sunset Riders, a phrase I have obviously had to use a lot in this video, before starting stages players are shown the boss to take out at the end of each one. So next we will look at the hunt for Boot Hill Buzzard. This stage, theme wise, is different to anything we have seen before from Konami in that it seems to be a spooky Halloween themed Wild West stage, with ghosts, skeletons and a whole range of undead enemies to take out. This stage feels a bit like riding a Wild West ghost train fairground ride, it's got a really fun atmosphere. Like Triple Bloody H, the Buzzard utilises a shovel as his main weapon and tries his very best to bury his opponents. His shovel is particularly interesting as it also seems to double up as a shotgun, which I found quite cool. There is a mine stage where players pursue 5 card stud. And movement wise this level reminds me of a stage players have to traverse a train in within Sunset Riders. This level is not too different in that players navigate moving minecarts, although the mechanics have been built on further in the stage, providing two levels of track varied gradients across the area and the carts even speed up and slow down. The carts even sometimes jump upwards or off the track. There was a lot of action in this stage which ultimately ends up with a fight against 5 cards. This stud has the ability to jump between two levels, can magically throw his cards in a number of patterns and can even spawn enemies but he can be conquered with enough effort. We also have a stage that sees players walk on foot along the side of or on a train track, obviously taking out a number of the usual suspects along the way. The latter portion of this stage introduces a function we have not yet covered, essentially auto-scrolling sections that control like a space shoot 'em up where eagles carry the balls at a very fast pace. I guess these sections of play were programmed in the game in place of the horse riding sections in Sunset Riders, which also auto scroll. However, we have more freedom of movement around the screen with the aid of these eagles. After taking out the small bandits riding the tracks below, a mid boss fight occurs against an enemy riding a hot air balloon. But the most effort goes into taking out the wagon train at the end of the stage that can fire projectiles from a number of compartments that become visible throughout the encounter. The saddle store stage once again features flying cows, once again bringing a range of space shoot 'em up elements to the table. By far the most standout feature of the stage though is the boss, a scorpion cowboy stand atop an even bigger scorpion. But fortunately only the man scorpion must be defeated to progress. The final stage sees players seeking out the Masked Bull. The opening section of this stage looks like a traditional town setting found in this game or Sunset Riders, but features a storm in the sky to give the area an epic foreboding feel as the game draws closer to its finish. Players must soon avoid falling chandeliers of inner building before going through a secret passage behind a bookcase into hopefully the Masked Bull's hideout. There are falling traps here to avoid prison cells and heavily armoured doorways, housing the gold that is hidden. At the end of this section, the heroes catch the town's corrupt mayor and save Lily Bovine. She informs the heroes to rodeo to Skull Mountain to face the masked bull in one final fight. This boss has more varied attacks and complicated patterns than any enemy found previously in the game, however defeating him and throwing him in jail at the end of the title reveals he was just Sheriff Terrible with a mask on the entire time. Which leads me to wonder why he was not capable of putting up such a fight when we encountered him the first time in the game. Video game logic I suppose. Now reflecting back on this entire game, as you can see it delivers a very similar experience to Konami's earlier game, Sunset Riders, as we have illustrated time and time again throughout this video. In fact, the games are so similar in playstyle and aesthetics, it would be very difficult to not think of this game as its successor. I guess if the Wild West Cowboys license could have found a bit more success away from gaming, then this game would be a lot more fondly remembered now. 
but one would imagine after the license flopped, Konami never really had as much of an incentive to push this one as much as they did with many of their other titles. I think if this game had have had simply been called Sunset Riders 2 from the get go, and it included a similar cast of characters to the original, many more people would have taken note of this game. But sadly, these furries went over most people's heads. Except for what I can see a few strange deviant artists. If you have not played this one yet, make sure you give it a go, as it should be just as celebrated as many of the other Konami arcade games from the period. But for obvious licensing reasons, this one gets nowhere near the same level of attention, and it's probably every bit as good as Sunset Riders too. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of Wild West Cowboys of Mesa. Let me know what other run and guns you would like me to cover on here in the future. I would be curious to hear your thoughts. Creating these non-algorithm friendly YouTube videos full time is possible in part due to the fantastic people who back this channel on Patreon, which means I can pursue video making full time without needing to pretend I am super excited about whatever the trending Nintendo Switch game is. Which means I can talk about the games that evoke much more of an interest for me. Which hopefully is more interesting to you and brings a little bit more diversity to the platform. If you too want to support the channel further then consider backing me over on Patreon. You can gain access to videos early, vote on upcoming content, get producer credits on the end of these videos and much much more. Every little helps maintaining this channel for longer. So special shout outs go out to Sebastian Bellis, Carl Johnson, Heo Paulo Lopez, Joseph Rasmick, Doug Perkins, Ryan Dinch, Evan Balder, Philip Mamp, Campbell Rambo 82, A Murder of Crows, Aswell Rarakai, Keith Ferguson, Dropkin Varela, Prince Knight, Michael Cullix, Ago, Jordan Durant, TOG Driver, Angel Light 85, Alephia Swanson, Timothy W. Haskins II, Nick Daniels, Prince Zana, Carlos Domingos, Sponge Matt B, Glennie Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of a Ted, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Instant Gratification, Monkey, James Bishop, JB, Posty XL, Michael Hall, Bubba Kitty, One Star, Chesty LaRue, Langston Miller, Noob, Casey Wright, Zai, Brian Barry, Sir Lagney, Chris Marjorie, Stephen Lewis, Sarah Powell, Vlamic Renee, Sarai, H. Al Sarai, Marvin Araliga, Chris Cool, Punky Dooster, Matthew Rindle, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Marco Soto, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Jazzy Tay, Crazy L, Master Jinx, Hans Christian, Time Lord Samwave, Dan Van Dam, Adam Castin, Gregory Smorajewitz, Rick 67, Louis Fiant, John Bates, David Bell, Angry Little SOB, Mike Bruce, Bruno, Andis Reinsbergs, Chris Fisk, Ivan M, Paul Elliott, Me Machine Dean, Antonio Rodriguez, Dan Barlow Jr., Craig Jenkins, Tom Elliott, Retroverse.com, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bizanski, and the rest of you. Ye bloody ha. I love you. <laughs>